I enjoy coming to work every day knowing that clients are depending on me to guide them through uh, whatever financial needs they have. Every client we have is, is different. And so it's really about finding out what's really the most important thing per client. With financial planning, everything is interconnected. So a comprehensive plan means that you're taking care of income needs now, income needs in the intermediate term, and income needs long term. We'll do an asset cycle portfolio. We'll do a risk alized test. We'll do a life insurance audit or a life insurance review. And, and so when we build a deep relationship with our clients, then we can take a step back. And then we can look at different options to help them specifically get to their goals. One of the things I feel our job is as advisors is to introduce strategies to clients that maybe they did not know that they were out there. But it's our idea, to, our, our job to come out and say, have you ever thought about this? And the planning is, it's not always about income, but a lot of it is also about the legacy. So the, the element of family is very important to us and it's important to our clients. Hello, my name is Steve Jablonski and I'm the host of Financially Speaking with Jeff Bush. Uh, we have an exciting show today. Uh, last month we covered Social Security Maximization Through Comprehensive Planning, Part 1. And because of the overwhelming response, people want to learn more about it, a little bit of review, but also uh, some new concepts. So uh, with that said, Jeff? Well, hello, Steve. Welcome to the show. Uh, yeah, so Social Security Part 2, how exciting. Uh, yeah, so the response is overwhelming. Uh, we really covered a lot in that, in that first show, and it's almost like you can't cover it all in a half an hour. I mean, when we go out uh, and take our show on the road, we, you know, it takes us all, you know, well over an hour, an hour and a half to yeah. do uh, a presentation. So we're trying to boil it down into this, uh, in this format, which is good. But, you know, so part two. So I, I, I want to mention, too, uh, we're here on PCTV, and we're celebrating our uh, eight-year anniversary. It's hard to believe, but uh, eight years ago, we started this little uh, venture here on uh, PCTV, and here we are uh, still doing it. And, of course, back then, uh, we did the show uh, at the PCTV studio, which was in Pottstown High School, and... Now we've moved to our office here in uh, Pottstown, uh, high, high above the uh, Smith Plaza as I look out uh, on the corner of High and Hanover. But uh, it's nice to be doing the show, and it's nice to be here, and it's nice to be talking about Social Security. And, and Jeff, we uh, have a process we follow at Informed Family called the Wellspring Formula. And, and I think a really good place to start is how does Social Security intertwine with our, with our seven pillars? Yeah, well, so, a couple, so let's take a step back. Okay. Uh, with the, well, the Wellspring formula was something that we created a couple years ago, uh, kind of in response to a lot of the conversations that we had with our clients. And uh, we, you know, we went back and we, with our team and we discovered that there's a lot of things that we do for our clients. There's like 113 things that we do for our clients uh, over the course of our relationship. And we really boiled that down to seven pillars. So the seven pillars um, are really, you know, when you look at the seven pillars, it's part of a lot, uh, the Social Security intertwines with a lot of the, se the seven pillars. You know, we've got uh, wealth management, it's part of that, it's part of risk management, it's part of tax planning, it's part of inc income, it's a big part of income planning, it's, it's actually the cornerstone of income planning, but it's really, um, and legacy planning yeah, too, because sure. Social Security is, uh, if you're married, it's all about, you know, how you coordinate benefits with your spouse, so um, it really, you know, kind of ties into the seven pillars, and, uh, you know, the seven pillars is just become so instrumental in what we what we do with our with our planning with our clients and a, and a lot of people don't realize that 
the decision they make around Social Security is probably one of the biggest of their lives. And so how should we, how should, how do you think people should be thinking of it? It's a big, it's a big, it's a big financial decision. Let's put it that way. It's one of the, it's one of the biggest financial decisions that you make. And a lot of, you know, a lot of people don't really approach it that way. You know, they're getting advice from other people that might not know their situation or might not know everything about social security. And there's so many other things that you have to consider when making your social security decision. You got to look at your health. You got to look at your mortality. You got to look at your your work life, your spouse, your spouse's work life. There's really, you know, a lot of a lot of things that really enter into the social security decision, Steve. And so, people just think of it as a, a monthly income, uh, but thinking a little bit differently, I don't think people really realize how much money they're going to be receiving over their lifetime. Yeah, I mean, if you look at just you know, in its pure simple form, if you're getting uh, you know, I think on this slide here, we're showing a married couple getting $41,000 a year, which is a pretty substantial benefit. But if you get, let's say you just take $40,000 over a 25-year period of time, that's a million dollars, right? So it's a, bit, it's a big number. It's probably, you know, the biggest asset that most, most people have. Uh, and the other thing to, to consider with, with a Social Security benefit, that it's guaranteed. Uh, you're going to receive it for as long as you live. And there's a cost of living adjustment, or a COLA, which, um, you know, is, it's, that's how you keep pace with inflation in retirement. And I don't, I don't think we mentioned the COLA last time. So what has it traditionally or historically been, and what are some of the expectations the cola, the for cola, next year? The cost of living adjustment is, uh, I think, historically... Um, it's been about two and a half percent. More recently, it hasn't been that much because inflation has been pretty low. Uh, cost of living has been pretty low. But I think that's going to change the next year. They're, look, they're projecting increases. You, you might be closer yeah, to these numbers I than me. I think it's five, five plus percent. Five percent. Yeah. yeah, so... You know, we're anticipating that people are going to get a, a substantial increase in their Social Security benefit next year. And, you know, as goods, you know, and we're living, really, Steve, we're living ever since this pandemic, uh, we're seeing a, an increase in uh, goods and services. So that translates to, you know, these, you know, cost of living adjustments. So it's good in a way that, you know, you're, when you're on a fixed income with Social Security, it gives you some kind of a buffer to account for, uh, you know, for inflation. Yep. And so if we go back to the eligibility, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, what does that look like? Well, you're eligible for, so for a Social Security benefit when you've worked for 10 years or 40, or 40 quarter, 40 quarters or 40 credits. So it's, uh, you know, if you've, if, you've wor if you've worked for, I always say, just to keep it simple, if you work for 10 years, yeah. you, you qualify for a benefit. And uh, oftentimes, like, if you haven't worked, right, outside the home for, a, you know, for a paycheck, let's say, uh, you can also piggyback off of your spouse and receive a... Uh, a spousal benefit. So there's a couple different ways you can get a Social Security benefit. And uh, so the age range starts at 62. And yeah, so qualifying for Social Security, so you're, there's a full retirement age, um, which I don't know, do we have that slide? Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah, so your full retirement age. So let's say that you were born in 1954 or earlier, your full retirement age is 66. Mm -hmm. If you were born in 1960 or later, your full retirement age is 67. Yep. And if you were born between the years of 1955 and 1959, it, it phases into 67. So it's 66 and, and, a, and a fraction, 66 and a couple of months. 
uh, but you can take your benefit as early as age 62. So you can take an early benefit, which a lot of people do because they don't want to. They don't work that late, yeah. long for whatever reason, and they want to take a benefit early. So you can do that. So you can take a reduced benefit when you're 62, um, or if you want to wait, eat, so you can wait beyond your full retirement age. So if your full retirement age is 66, you can wait as long as uh, age 70. And when you do that, you know, you're either, you're either taking a reduction if you take it early or you're getting uh, enhanced uh, or delayed benefits, to, uh, what they call delayed retirement credits if you go past your full retirement age. And Jeff, I get, we get the question a lot of times that people, they say, oh, I want to work to my full retirement age. And, and they think there's maybe a big jump in Social Security at that point, but from 62, the full retirement age to 70, kind of give us an idea of how, how does the benefit go up? Right? Yeah, well, if, you're take, if you take your benefit at 62, you're going to get about a 25% reduction, right? And then 63, it's about, eight, you're getting about an, uh, if, you, if you're taking it, yeah, if you're taking it at 62, you get a 25% reduction. If you take it at 63, you're getting about a 20% reduction. Uh, and then, so, if, so then at 66, you're getting your full retirement benefit. And then if you, if you go past age 66, you go to 67, you're getting another 8%. So if you, if you do, so you can delay it for four years, right, between 66 and 70. So you can, 8% for four years, you can get another 32% or increase it by about a third. It's yeah. pretty significant. Yeah, so, but all the elements have to be right, Steve. So I would say you have to be healthy, um, still working and yep. collecting a paycheck, right? Because you need, you need some income. So there's a lot of things that factor in to making a decision. And I'll also say that, you know, in our firm, you know, we have uh, social security uh, software. We're a social security analyzer, right, which you use a lot where we analyze, uh, you know, your Social Security benefit and really come up with an ultimate uh, claiming strategy. And so when we go, uh, there's really no reason past 70 then to, to, with the delayed credits. Yeah, so you're getting, yeah, so if you, if you delay it past your full retirement age, if you delay it past 66 uh, and you go to 70, there's no, there's no further ramp up past age 70. So if you, have, if you haven't taken it by age 70, you want to take it then. Yep. So we should also talk about coordinating work uh, and earning a paycheck with getting a Social Security benefit. So once you've reached full retirement age, you can really earn as much as you want and not have your Social Security benefit uh, jeopardized. Um, and it's, it's interesting because that was not always the case. Uh, back in, I think it was probably about 20 years ago or so, where there was a, you know, there was a labor shortage. They're having trouble finding workers, so they were giving an incentive to people that were taking a Social Security benefit to come back and work. Yep. So they said, okay, well, if you're at full retirement age, you could still, you can work collect a paycheck, and also collect a Social Security benefit at the same time. So that's what happened. Um, so then they made that law permanent. So it gives, like, it's an incentive for people to, to continue to work even after they're taking their Social Security benefit. And in our software, it does tell us the exact break-even year for our clients. But generally speaking, what, what does that look like? So the break-even... The break-even analysis that you're referring to is really, so break-even means taking your benefit early versus taking it uh, at full retirement age versus taking it late, yep. delaying it to, to age 70. And the break the break even means, okay, well, when is it, when are you collecting the same amount of dollars? Like when do those two lines on the chart converge? And they converge somewhere around age 78, 79, 
somewhere right around in there, maybe 80, somewhere around there. So that means that, and just just in its just in absolute terms, right? It means that if you live to age 79, uh, and that's the break-even point, yep. you will have collected the same amount of Social Security benefit in whole dollars if you if you took your benefit early, yep. if you took it uh, at full retirement age, or if you took it at age 70, right? So, just to to further explain that 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 chart. If you're if you don't live that long, right? So if you die early, yeah. then it would have benefited you to take your benefit early. If you uh, conversely, if you live past your full retirement, if you live past that that break-even point, so if you live past age uh, 80, then it will have benefited you to wait. Okay, and there's a couple other factors. There's, a, there's, you know, there's the human element of people's view of longevity and how long they're going to live. And our experience has been people generally underestimate how long they're going to live. You talk to people yeah. when they retire, and you, they talk about living into your 80s and 90s. A lot of people don't think they're going to live that long. Yep. So it really, like, really kind of skews the uh, bias towards taking your benefit early, right. right? But there's another factor in there, and that is that when you're looking at a couple, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the first, so the one spouse may not have longevity, but the other spouse does, the larger Social Security benefit is what prevails, right? So let's just talk about maybe a husband and a wife where let's say the husband has the larger social security benefit and he also is not as healthy, yeah. right? So he dies first. The surviving spouse, in this case the, the wife who uh, outlives her husband, you know, she's going to revert over to his benefit yeah. when he dies and she's going to collect the larger benefit. So it's not just your own yeah longevity, your own break-even point, it really, you know, is really comes down to coordinating the benefit with your spouse. So, you know, we always like to say, you know, you can't make your social security decision in a vacuum. And that's what we mean. There's like just a lot of factors that go go into it. So I think the overriding theme here is that you want to consult with a professional when you're making this important decision. Because it's, you know, you, you can't undo it. Um, you know, so the, the decisions that you're making when you claim your Social Security benefit are really benefits, are really um, decisions that you have to live with for your lifetime. And, and you touched on the spouse a little bit, but why don't we get into a, a little deeper about the two, the two uh, spouses and, and how does that work? Well, the way that works is uh, you're... So the spouse, you're either going to claim your benefit or you're going to claim your spouse's benefit, right? So or, or when you, I say your spouse's benefit, a, a spousal yeah, benefit, spousal. which is typically 50% of what your spouse is getting, yeah. right? So that's considered a spousal benefit. So you're going you're gonna to get either, either, one, um, either one or the other. So if, if half of your spouse's benefit is higher, you're going to take that. If your benefit is higher, you're going to take your own benefit. And then that just, as you said, that at a death, the lower one just goes away. Yeah, so the larger check prevails, right? So the, lar the larger check is what um, is, going to, is going to come through when uh, when if, when the first spouse dies, yeah. right? So if the let's say um, again going back to the example of the husband and the wife, where the husband's uh, social security check is higher, okay. right? If he dies first, then the surviving wife will lose her benefit in exchange for getting her husband's benefit, which was larger. So that okay? could be 
from a 33 to almost a 50 percent? Yeah, so you figure, you know, at the very least, she's going to get half of his benefit, right? So, or, or she could be getting almost the same as, as, as he's getting. Yeah. So it's a significant loss of income, and yeah, it's, you're going to lose, you're going to lose either uh, uh, anywhere from a third of your family income up to, let's say, 49 percent of your family income. Uh, when 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 the spouse dies, now if the if the smaller uh, social security benefit, if the person earning the smaller social security benefit dies, then that's that's simply the the surviving spouse simply just retains their benefit. But it is significant to mention here that it's 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 a it's a loss of family income uh, when when the first spouse dies. Yeah. So let's move over to some planning and how do we take social security and traditional IRAs and you know with when we sit down and we uh, put together an income model for our clients it's really about getting them income so we have an example here and um, it really looks at one where it's all traditional one it's a all Roth and then that there's a mixture why don't you tell us a little bit about that and the kind yeah, of the well, theory and taxes behind I that? I think the significant thing about this is that this is, a, is that uh, the Social Security uh, benefits are low enough in this example. Uh, we're using $31,000, so they're under the threshold of when taxes would kick in yeah. on the Social Security alone. So then it becomes an exercise of whether... Uh, they want to take income from their traditional IRA or income from their Roth IRA to meet their uh, their total income needs. So their in, their total income needs are seventy five thousand dollars. So that means they're not getting enough from Social Security. They're only getting thirty one thousand dollars from their Social Security benefits, which means they got to get another forty three thousand, almost forty four thousand from their investments. So then we get into, well, is it better to take it from a traditional IRA or is it better to take it from a Roth IRA? So under scenario number one, they're taking all of their income from the traditional IRA, okay? So when you do that, um, then part of your distribution on your t traditional IRA becomes taxable. So in this example, um, they're, ta they're, meet they're taking 43956 from their traditional IRA, but they're paying taxes of $3,890 from, uh, from their IRA distribution. So they're really netting 71,110 um, in that example. So it's not the optimum way uh, to, to take that uh, to take that income so then we jump over to scenario number two and we look at uh, taking all of the income from the Roth IRA so with a Roth IRA none of the distribution is taxed right so these are all uh, after-tax dollars that we're spending here so we're meeting the goal of getting $75,000 of family income. So we're taking the 43,956 from the Roth IRA, and the 43,956 is uh, all tax-free because it comes from the Roth. So in this in this example, Steve, we're getting $75,000, and none of it's taxed. Okay, um, but there's a problem with that, right? What's the problem? Most people don't have unlimited amounts of Roth dollars. Yeah, so if you, if you figure that they've got, let's say they've got a half a million dollars, yeah. so $500,000 in um, a Roth IRA, and they're taking out 43,956, that's about, what, 9%, something like that, uh, which is a pretty hefty withdrawal rate. So that's probably not an optimum strategy yeah. either. So then we move over into um, scenario number three, where we st we straddle it, right? So we take they still need to the forty three nine fifty six. So we yep. say we're going to take half of it from the Roth, and we're going to take half of it from the traditional, yep. right? So twenty one nine seventy eight from the Roth, twenty one nine 
21,978 from the traditional, right? So now we've accomplished our, yes. our goal here because even with the 21,978 of traditional IRA, which is subject to tax, you're under the, the tax threshold. So uh, none, of, none of that is going to be taxed if we run it through the, the tax grid. Right, so and and the Roth is tax free to begin with, yep. right? So and now you're taking and so instead of taking out about nine percent of your uh, holdings, you're only taking out a little bit over four, let's yep. say four and a half percent. So now you're you know that it makes the Roth IRA a lot more uh, sustainable if yep. you're only taking out four and a half percent. So it's pretty it's a pretty significant uh, planning tool here using. The Roth IRA, and that's why we're such big proponents of the Roth IRA because it allows you to generate tax-free income in retirement. There's not very ma many ways to do that, uh, create creating tax-free dollars. So you know we like the Roth IRA, but you have to plan for it, yep. right? So you have to start putting Roths in when you're younger and when you're working, and now uh, the 401ks. What, actually, this has been uh, for about the last 10 years or so, they, they've put uh, Roth 401ks in. So if you're working and you're taking money out of your paycheck and putting it into a 401k, yep. you can direct money into the Roth, uh, which is a great way to, uh, sure. to generate future tax-free yep. money. Yep. And so, if, Jeff, if we go back to 2015, and there's been some tax law changes, 2015, 2019. Kind of let's go over a couple of those, do some summaries of maybe what's changed. Yeah, well, I think one thing that um, I want to mention, too, that uh, when we started talking about uh, taking a Social Security benefit and working, right? So once you're full retirement age, you can work and uh, not have it affect your earnings, but if you're before that. So let's say you're, you're prior to age 66. Let's say you're 62, yeah. you're taking a Social Security benefit, and you want to work. You really are pretty much limited to working part-time, and I think the threshold is close to $19,000, a little under that, that you can earn and still not uh, be affected yep. by, uh, by working. So if you earn over that, then... What the Social Security people do is they withhold a dollar for every two dollars you make over that that threshold. So you have to really be careful about that. Um, in the the calculation is such that it goes back into your account, and eventually you do get that back when you reach full retirement age. But you do have to be mindful of that. Um, so yeah. So getting back to uh, 2015. Um, so when they balance the budget. Uh, back in 2015, one of the things that they did was they they took away the uh, the dual the dual claiming strategy yep. where you could uh, you could claim file and suspend file and suspend yep. that's the that's the technical term we used to, we used to call it double dipping <laughs> but uh, I guess I guess that's not the, that's not very technical but. Uh, file and suspend. So you could you so you could you could be uh, you could be 66, uh, still work, and claim a spousal benefit, and your benefit would still keep going up. So they considered that a little bit of a loophole, and they did away with that. But they grandfathered uh, those that were still eligible to do that. So I and I forget the cutoff date on that. It's like. I think if you were born in 1954, January is it Jan January, January of 1954 yep. or earlier? Or earlier, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, if we get into some of the the changes for 2021, kind of on the high the high note there. Uh, yeah. So in 2021. Um, so there's going to be the, there's going to be the cost of living adjustment. So last year. Uh, workers got 1.3%. Uh, this year, we think they're going to get a lot more. Yep. Um, the maximum maximum taxable earnings was increased to $142,000 a year, 142,800. So, if you make 
up to 142,800, you're you're paying Social Security tax on all of that, um, and then the earnings limit um, for those who are under the full retirement age, as I said earlier, is uh, is eighteen thousand nine hundred and sixty dollars. Okay, and full retirement age is on the rise, as we said. Uh, newly eligible retirees born in 1959 will have to wait until 66 and 10 months to get their full benefit. Mm -hmm. Even though they're turning 62 this year, they can get a partial or a reduced benefit. Um, they can't get their full benefit until they're 66 and 10 months. And the maximum possible benefit for full retirement age is 3,113, okay? And you have to work 40 credits. Uh, in 2021, you'll have to get, have $1,470 in earnings per quarter to qualify for a credit. So I think uh, that's about it for Social Security. So this was a, uh, another quick show, Steve, and say we have so much information here with Social Security. I should mention that, you know, contact our office yes. if you need more information. We'll, we'll put a slide up where... Uh, you can reach us either by phone or by uh, email. So well, with that said, uh, we're going to sign off. This is Financially Speaking.